Well, I welcome everybody. Thanks so much for coming out tonight to see Randall Monroe and Corley Doctorow in conversation on the occasion of the release of Corey's latest book. Corey confided that during lockdown, he wrote nine books. <laughs> I made the local friend. <laughs> If you keep on living. Um, and it's just so wonderful to have them here. Uh, tonight. I'll introduce them in just a second. My name is Dr. Citrin. I have been a fan of Corey's Randalls for a long time and uh, helped start what became the Berkman Klein Center for Internet Society here at HLS. And um, one thing to know logistically is that built-in year is here our great local indie comic and bookstore, and they have copies of Corey's book. It's all nine or just this one. Uh, they have a few of them, and they should have some around the way too. Excellent. Yeah. Right on the other side of this hall, and that'll be available after uh, our session is over here. May I make a non returnable for you? And we uh, are recording everything, as is probably the uh, actual. The agency, so just be aware that you're under constant surveillance. I'm doing good work right here. There is a yeah. Um, so, um, uh, how to describe Corey Doctorow? Well, uh, at the back of the book, uh, describes this book as absorbing and ruthless, but I think that may be up to you for absorbing <laughs> and ruthless. Um, and I've seen Corey in action uh, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation as an advocate. I think it's fair to say at this point you are a connoisseur of excrement. <laughs> <laughs> he is most recently coined the word in shitification. And he did a bleakness on Zoom. I don't know. <laughs> but um, that word was just recognized by what, like the American Dictionary the Dialect Society. It's not the American Dialectical Society. They've got different ideas. <laughs> they hold both ideas at the same time. Right. <laughs> American Dialect Society named in Shinification its word of the year. Right. I'm getting a move on. You can also run the blog crabhound.com. And uh, this was a wonderful uh, quote from about 25 years ago. He was very excited about Napster. I don't know if anybody has said the name. They were excited about Napster, but Quote, in the Napster universe, the act of downloading a file made another copy of it available. And this is an entirely new kind of economics. It's a tragedy of common sense reverse. So the sheep shit grass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to think about that for a minute. <laughs> well, you don't. Now, you don't feel like you have to think about it. But, um, wow. But in part, I think that is part of Corey's ability to behold the world as it is unflinchingly, and to convey that message to the rest of us who may have a natural tendency to whistle past certain graveyards present in the future. And in doing so, to help envision a better society, a kinder one, a juster one, a freer one, with a definition of freedom that isn't sort of just the Cato Institute definition of freedom. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Oh. That's to our friends at Cato. That's where they do what they love too. <laughs> so uh, Corey has a way of viewing the world uh, just so um, so fiercely and so observantly, and that's something that I think he shares so well with Randall Monroe. Randall Monroe, author of books such as What If, How To, and Thing Explainer. Um, and the comic XKCD is somebody who also is so intensely curious about how things work, how they might be made better, and if looking at the negative for the purpose of discerning, advancing, and even fighting for the positive. And that's why I am so excited to see both Randall and Corey in discussion tonight. And so I think that well, I should turn it over to you to uh, begin the inquisition. Thank, Thank you so Thank much. You. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, I owe you a very specific thank you. Um, because about, so it's 18 years, 19 years ago now, um, when I first started drawing comics, um, I was posting them on, on my website, which, which, like many people, I had a website that wasn't sure what to put on it. I started posting drawings from my old notebooks and, and linking them, you know, on my, my live journal, of you know, sharing with some friends. Um, and one day I got a message on AOL's messenger from someone who I did not know, and actually still don't know who this was. Oh. And they said, hey, I, I saw one of the things, one of the little strategic you drew, and I sent it to my friend Corey, and he really liked it and wants to know if he can put it on his blog. And, and I said, sure, and figured out which blog this was, and was like, oh no, I need more web server space. <laughs> and Corey, we got a server set up to handle traffic because um, suddenly there would be more than like one person a day looking at my comments. <clears throat> And and that uh, then you you posted uh, one of my comics to your blog, and that was the first time I had suddenly a bunch of people reading it, and was absolutely the single event that kicked off me getting to have a career doing this. Oh, I'm very so, honored by that. Thank you. Thank you. And and um, I don't know. I know that writing stuff for the internet is both like you get a ton of feedback, maybe more than you necessarily want all the time. But you also, it can feel like you're just throwing things out in the void and like only imaginary internet commenters are reading it or thinking anything about it. And and so I just want to say like, thanks, because this was a, you posted a thing and it materially changed someone's life in a really cool way. And I'm thank so you. so to hear that, Randall. Thank you. Um, uh, and, 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 and it goes without saying, but obviously, I amplified something very clever that you did, and then you went on to do a string of things that were each of them more clever than the last. And that, you know, it's I'm 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 very honored by the credit you give me, but I think the credit is really due to you. You've done something really remarkable with XKCD. We'll, we'll say it's 50-50. All right, there we go. I'll take half of it. Um, so so I really enjoyed your book. Um, I was really curious reading it. I read a lot of it when I was on an airplane and didn't have an internet connection to look things up. And a lot of the a lot of the things that happened in the book sounded both like this villain is doing a thing that's like clearly you know extremely out there and how horrible it is. But also, wait, I kind of think I saw a news story about this. Is this a real thing? And and I just had to go through the whole book not being able to go and check which things were real and which ones weren't. But I did start to wonder more and more. Were you? As you write about these characters who are very thinly veiled or sometimes named outright, doing horrible things, and you're you're describing them committing crimes, like did you expect to get sued by anyone? <laughs> and was it more like who were you the most expecting to sue you? And were you hoping for it or hoping? <laughs> right. Well, let me let me step back and say this is the second yeah. book in a in a, a series that you can read in any order. Uh, I wrote the first one during lockdown, Red Team Blues, about the last adventure of a hard fighting, two fisted forensic accountant who spent forty <laughs> years in Silicon Valley busting high tech finance scams. And I had this this conceit that I could write the last novel in a long running beloved series without <laughs> writing the other books. <laughs> nice. Uh, and that it would just have that that last episode of MASH vibe without the tedious previous 11 seasons. And um, my editor liked it so much that he bought two more, which then presented this conundrum. Because <laughs> it's very decidedly his last adventure. And then I realized you don't have to tell them in order. Uh, you know, nominally, you take away some of the suspense. Maybe this beloved long-running character will, won't, uh, won't die at the end of this book. But of course, you, no one ever expects like Spencer to die at the end of the book. And, and so that suspense is never really there. And if you tell the story backwards or out of order, you don't have any continuity problems because you're not foreshadowing, you're backshadowing. <laughs> and the more kind of Baroque detail you chuck in there, the more of like a premeditated motherfucker you appear to be, even if you're just winging it the whole time. So the last book, the first book is his last adventure. It's a cryptocurrency heist because if you're gonna write about fi high tech finance scams, the place to start is with cryptocurrency. But the, um, 
the, the, this book is set in the in this uh, dot com era, uh, the time when Yahoo bought and destroyed every successful tech company that anyone could imagine, and um, and and it's during this period that that is itself a bezel, B E Z Z L E bezel, not B E Z E L, the black rectangle, is John Kenneth Galbraith's term for the magic interval after the con artist has your money, but before you know it's gone, and in that moment the national stock of happiness goes up because, you know, so long, so long as no one asks Sam Bankman Freed for the money yet, they're rich and so is he, right? It's, it's only when you try to redeem that you've, that you've got a problem. And he'll tell you that in his sentencing hearing, just let me go back to the casino and I'll make the money to make everybody whole again. So um, the bezel in this case is like the moment after the dot-com crash right up to the uh, uh, great financial crisis where everyone is feeling very flush. And this was a time rife with all kinds of scams that were later on uncovered. Things that seemed legitimate later on fell apart. And so it's a good moment for it. And yeah, I, I invo invoke a lot of stuff that really happened in that period. And this is a kind of epiphenomenon of being a blogger, right? If you're, a, if you're a, like a regular writer, uh, whenever you have an idea or something that seems interesting, you make a note to yourself in a little notebook like this. I do carry a little notebook like this, but it's almost entirely boggle words uh, because my family plays a lot of boggle on vacation and I'm the only one who carries around a notebook. Um, what I do when something seems important is I write it up for public consumption, which is like this very mnemonic exercise, right? When instead of like scribbling something cryptic to yourself that you promise yourself, A, you'll be able to decipher your handwriting and B, you'll figure out what you meant when you've done so, you write it up for other people and that makes you remember it. Uh, it also sticks it in a database. Right, so there's like literally like just a MySQL backend on a WordPress site with 60,000 blog posts I wrote about everything that ever seemed important. Um, so you get this like sort of super saturated soup of little fragmentary story ideas that are kind of knocking around your head and they nucleate and they crystallize and you get like a novel or a story out of it. Um, and then you can find the details in your blog and then there's the annotations from the people who showed up to tell you you're full of shit. And, and so you can really like kind of pull together a lot of work very quickly one of the things I discovered during all these years of writing is that it's very hard to predict who's going to sue you or threaten you. And that both huh. things have happened a lot. And the, the, the primary predictor is not whether you've actually inflicted a wound on someone. It's really how thin-skinned they are. Like, there's just, you know, the Sacklers threatened me at one point over something really piddly, especially given all the other stuff that <laughs> happened. <laughs> but they had, you know, they had just like... Um, just vicious attack lawyers on retainer that anytime anyone breathed the, a hint that the Sacklers weren't just like good natured slobs who are funding art galleries uh, and helping people with the fourth uh, vital sign, the, the, that all important fourth vital sign pain, uh, you know, they, that uh, they would just show up and like Bigfoot you. Now, in terms of like whether I want to get sued, I don't like getting sued. Uh, <laughs> I don't like getting threatened either. There was one threat I really liked, but the rest of them I don't like. I'll tell you about the threat I like, but, but um, you know, I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, right? I, I hang out with great lawyers. I, I remember when my first novel came out, Down at the Magic Kingdom, it had a blurb from Larry Lessig on it. And I was like, oh, Disney, please. Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. This would be great. And, and I think that they looked at it and they were like, nah, nah. Nah. Um, but you know, the one threat that I really liked, uh, so when, when uh, um, uh, Bird rolled out their scooters, uh, their dockless scooters, and then they just sort of had this thing where they were encouraging people to just leave them anywhere, and people who were, used wheelchairs couldn't get down the sidewalk, and they were all over the place, and police were impounding these by the thousands, and then Bird wasn't bothering to, to get them back, and they were being sold at auction for like 10 bucks each. There was a company that made, a Chinese company that made a screw-in uh, alternative uh, controller for it. So you could just go buy one at the at the auction and then put your own controller on it. And then it was your electric scooter for like five bucks. <laughs> and um, so I wrote about this and I, I'm not making this up. The chief counsel of Bird was called Linda Quack. Um, and according to her LinkedIn profile, her, her specialty was employment law. And she sent me a DMCA 1201 threat, which, you know, without getting into a lot of detail, this is like, to call it a red rag to a bull is to do uh, violence to good, hardworking red rags and bulls. I, I, this, like, you could not have sent it to someone who was more anxious to have someone really stupid with a lot of money try and make a bad precedent so that we could 
finally create some case law in a place where every time <laughs> something bad happened, the bad guys ran away as soon as the cavalry arrived. And I was like, maybe this person is stupid enough to hang in there and let us have a case and we can get a precedent. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, and then my uh, colleague, uh, Kit Walsh at EFF, who's a proud uh, uh, daughter of, uh, of, of MIT and Cambridge, uh, she sent a, um, uh, uh, a very sternly worded letter to them and they folded like a cheap suit, which is a pity. I just, I, that was the one fight I really, oh. I would have loved to cook Linda Quack's goose. That would have been just great. Um, I'm wondering when, when, um, when you were writing about uh, a scene set in 2006, you know, at the, at the beginning of the book, it's 2006, and you jump around, you know, you, we jump forward in time uh, yeah. throughout. But I remember you were describing, you know, which smartphone the character had in what year. Were there any anachronism things where you looked it up and you're like, whoa, wait a minute, that wasn't around then or, or anything like that? Like, I always feel like I, I have such a, like, weird... Huh. view of what was it's like i swear i saw this on youtube and then i look it up it was in 2004 that it was viral and i'm like right. it wasn't on youtube what did i even watch things on before you know right right you saw, uh. yeah, yeah you saw it in a flash video player yeah um, so i have this thing that i do every morning where i not that i i go to uh i go to <laughs> my blog archives for this day from 20 years oh, ago, nice. 15 years ago, five years ago, one year ago. And I pull out the headlines that seem interesting and I put them in my newsletter. And I compare this to like when you're working dough, you get the stuff at the edge that's kind of dried out and crumbly and you fold it back into the middle. And so I, I, it's a real interesting way to kind of revisit your priors. You know, mm -hmm. JP stands up and says, oh, here's this funny thing that you used to say 25 years ago. Like, I sort of remember saying that because I quoted myself saying that 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And last week I found that blog post from 20 years ago. And so I have a pretty good, it's like on the one hand, it's very atemporal because mm -hmm. I have, uh, there's a lot of currency for things that happened a long time ago all kind of jumbled around in there. On the other hand, I have a pretty good sense of the timeline of when it all happened. And you know, and I do get a, a nice frisson often where I'll be like, oh, it's been 10 years. It's been 10 years since that mm -hmm. thing that I've been thinking about has happened. Or it's been 15 years. Often it's obits. And you know, you get a moment where you're like, no, it's been 10 years or 15 years since they left mm -hmm. us. And you know, that's also quite nice and bittersweet to, to have a way that you revisit the people that that you know aren't with us anymore, and and in a kind of structured way. I actually get a little anxious about it when I go on vacation because I don't do that day. Um, you know, if I'm on so, holiday, I don't do it, mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, I'm going to have to wait five years for that day to roll around again before I'll I'll revisit it. But I will. You know, I'm two years out from doing my 25 year posts, adding 25, 20, 15, uh, uh, five, uh, 10, five, and one. So. I, I love that kind of exercise. Um, I, I subscribed to a random email newsletter where someone does that with The Onion 20 oh, years ago. Cool. Um, and they just like, what are the headlines that The Onion had this week 20 years ago? How do these jokes look now? What, right. How do we feel about like, would this joke work now? Is this right. even like, we can't even figure out what the joke is because it, it's all forgotten. I, I like that kind of exercise. Yeah, I, 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 um, I go through, uh, I have gazetteers of Punch Magazine from the 19th mm -hmm. century. And they have the small uh, front of the book pieces where they're like little jokes. And there'll be things like, an American gentleman has invented a type writing machine that will allow you to record your thoughts faster than you can think them. No longer will we have to endure the indignity of bad tavern nibs. And clearly this was very funny in well, the mid 19th century. And I'm like, bad tavern nibs. I Not sure what that is, but I don't want one. I love reading the jokes. I, I love, so I, I always would read through any kind of the humor section in the library. And I feel like for me, it was something like 1955 was the point where if I read those like one panel, you know, New Yorker style cartoons, that was the point where like half of them, I couldn't figure out what the joke was, you know, because it's like a reference to something. And then, but then you go back like another, another 50 years, another, you know, century and, and, and I am more often baffled than not, but I love the, I love the ones where they'll, it's not just like Americans have invented a typewriting machine. It's like, ah, I see President Chester Arthur has decided to use his hat rack for hanging hats now. <laughs> and you're like, what? what, are you, what are you There's like 10 assumed things here. <laughs> 
you know. So the thing is, if you go far back enough, you don't have that problem anymore because you get to the golden age of the editorial cartoon where everything had a label, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. President Truman brackets standing in for America. But <laughs> but it'll still be references that you you know true. it'll be the equivalent of that. It'll be like like they'll have the. 20 to 50 feral hogs labeled and it's right. like you you know someone 100 years from now they understand what feral hogs are but right. they don't know why we're suddenly no, no, talking about right. 20 to 50 of you're them very right um do you, i i really appreciate the that your book has a uh you know that you that you've you've got the series of of forensic accountant as a main character yeah because i i and you know you describe uh, uh late in the book your character talks about with a a deep sense of you know personal intensity that I can't imagine is an invented trait. The love of going through really really complicated documents yeah. and trying to figure out what's at the heart of them. Um, I've always one of my weird late at night hobbies is I've always liked like reading NTSB incident reports or like. <laughs> Or like other other accident reports, ideally the ones where you know no one gets hurt, or like where sure. where something really weird happens. Because and and I was trying to think about like why do I find that so satisfying? Like why is it so interesting to me? And I think um, and and I feel like for me part of it is that it's a lot easier to make to, like it's a lot easier to make a mess than to like clean it up than to figure out what what went wrong. It's a lot easier to make something complicated than it is to undo that complication. And I love the uh, taking something that only took a few minutes to go wrong, but that you have a bunch of people working very hard to go back over and trace, how did this go wrong? How did this get tangled? Which thing broke where? Um, and, and, and I'm curious what you, like, where do, what about that appeals to you? Yeah, like, sure. I mean, there are people who do this really well, far better than I do. So some of you might know an incredible podcast called Where There's Your Well, There's Your Problem about civil engineering disasters, and they go into really deep detail with it. Um, Emily Bender uh, and, and Timnit Gebru, they say that their superpower is they read the footnotes. Uh, they follow the references. Uh, and so there are lots of people who do this really well. I you know, I'm not temperamentally a detail person. Uh, and um, uh, that puts me at a certain disadvantage in a lot of policy circles. There is a kind of policy fight that you win by being in sort of the six sigma of limbic tolerance for boredom, <laughs> right? And just being able to like write and also parse extremely complicated, like ornamentally complex documents. You know, when I was at uh, the World uh, uh, Intellectual Property Organization as a UN delegate for EFF, you know, the that it was so hard to understand just what people were saying. It wasn't the language barrier, and it wasn't even jargon. It was a kind of um, uh, like combat combat by uh, trying to bore the other person into uh, a sense of like, yeah, fine, let's just move on. Uh, in, in, in finance circles, they have this term MIGO, which stands for my eyes glaze over, where if you make the prospectus thick enough, people will assume that a pile of shit that big has to have a pony underneath it. And, and I think because I'm not temperamentally someone who, who does like that kind of thing, you know, I grew up as a fiction writer, not as a lawyer. And so I, uh, I have spent a lot of my life, you know, appreciating really good prose that's very clear and so on. And there are lots of lawyers who write like that, but there's also a kind of legal writing that is the opposite of that for, uh, un for deliberately, not because you've been poisoned by law school, but because that's a, 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 an effective tactic. Um, and so I think because it doesn't come naturally to me that the, the joys of it are much more manifest because when I manage it, I feel really proud of myself for having gotten to it. And I, I sometimes call these book, books Panama Papers fanfic <laughs> because when the Panama Papers drops and the Paradise Papers, Lux Leaks, uh, IRS Leaks, and so on, when you, if you dug deep into them, what you discovered is that a lot of the complexity there was also performative, right? It was also there just to kind of um, ward you off with uh, what Dana Claire calls the shield of boringness. And then when you actually dug into it, you started to see that there were funny little uh, uh, quirks going on in the text. So there's a thing I call millionaire on billionaire violence, 
uh, and this is where you have these elite enablers, right? Like these law firms like Mossack Fonseca that are helping the worst people in the world hide their money. And so they'll go to their client, they'll say, now, now look, our first wrapper is gonna be a Scottish trust, right? They're anonymous, uh, but there are tax authorities that you might be adverse to who can pierce that anonymity. So we're gonna make the officers of the Scottish trusts trust in the Grand Caymans. However, there are also adversaries who might be able to pierce the, the, the Grand Caymans trust, so we're gonna make all of their officers more Scottish trusts. And you think, at first it's like, oh yeah, sure. And then you look, but wait, wait I thought the Scottish trusts were permeable. So what is the point of making them, oh, I see, it's $10 million in additional billings and another $800,000 a year doing the paperwork for them. You're just, you're just a millionaire stealing from the billionaire and like, you know, YOLO. But also, it's great when you figure this out and then you realize they didn't figure this out and that they're just like me. I get this pile of paper for my tax preparer and at the top is a thing saying I've read and understood everything from it and I turn all the way to the back of it and I sign it and send it back to them. I mean, now I docu-sign it. I don't know, like I could have promised him a kidney at this point. Well, there's, there's it, it, it really highlights um, that it's not, it's not just that this is like an arcane magical language that if you speak it, you can, you can weave these spells and only someone who's willing to put in the time to read it can un undo it. It's also just like, it's an expression of power. Mm -hmm. It's saying like, like, I can write all kinds of complicated, uh, you know, things, but no one has to read them or listen to them or, you know, and do that's what they the say. sovereign citizen movement. Yeah, exactly. And, and like some of, so in, in a way, this kind of complexity that you're highlighting here is like a way of saying, like, we can write these legal documents and we have the legal system backing us up, which yeah. is why it's really when you want to have um, that heroic moment of disentangling it, um, you know, without without spoiling things too much, you have to bring in the the uh, a force that also that is you know that is both you know piercing through all of this by following all of the trails back and forth, but also has the force of of like political power behind it. Um, you know, to Terry Pratchett had a a good bit. Uh, I think it was in Going Postal where the bad guy was like a a baron buying up communication systems, and and it was just like throughout the book the financial machinations just got more and more complicated and then there was a heroic scene at the end like where the dictator comes along and is like you know what we're gonna figure out every single purchase here we're just gonna have hundreds of clerks go through all of the books and just unwind every purchase figure out where all the money went and like set things right and it was th like the only time i've had a climactic scene in a book that's like a bunch of clerks in a room carefully going over papers it, it, yeah. and and I and but it it works because the clerks are employed by a, a dictator government that is willing to enforce the law. Yeah. Uh, for you, I try to kind of reverse that dynamic a little. I think in this one. So the main uh, storyline in this is a uh, uh, a revenge story about prison tech. Uh, it, you you may have read recently that there have been a couple of high profile victories over prison tech providers. Uh, prison tech providers sort of embody the idea that capitalists hate capitalism and they would prefer to have captive customers who just pay whatever they demand. And what they've done is they've gone to prisons and they've offered them bribes to remove uh, postal mail, parcels, in-person visits, phone calls, the library, continuing education. And then they give the prisoners, quote unquote, free tablets where all of those services can be had, but at a significant multiple of what you or I would pay on the outside. And of course, these are people who themselves are earning in six states prohibited from earning anything as they do forced labor. The reminder that the uh, Constitution does still allow slavery for prisoners. Uh, and in uh, um, most other states, average 53 cents an hour, except in North Carolina, where it's capped at $1 a day. And they're paying $3 a minute for phone calls and $4 for uh, uh, an MP3. And then to kind of add insult to injury, when these prison tech providers who are all owned by private equity roll-ups and they change hands over and over again, the PE companies roll their debt and roll the debt and then a new PE entity st uh, steps in and grabs it. When this happens, they change technology providers. They're like, you know that thing where every now and again, like Microsoft will say, hey, we sold you these DRMD books, but now we're shutting down the DRM server. Imagine that, but the file that you're losing is the hand-drawn birthday card that your kid paid $5 to have scanned so that you could see it because no postal mail will be delivered to you and you're serving a 25 year sentence. And so figuring out the underlying scam that's going on here 
uh, in, this, in this element of the plot uh, is this very urgent mission for, for Marty Hench, for the forensic account, because his friend has gone to prison uh, and is kind of enmeshed in this. Um, and as they work on, on uncovering what's going on, they also um, are incurring the wrath of the prison management. Uh, and that puts the, the person uh, who's doing this, that puts their life in danger. And I made the kind of peak of that happen just after the, the uh, Trump changeover in 2016. And I, the, the piece that I like most about that, that scene setting is there's a moment where he's talking to an enforcer and the enforcer says, look, I know that this is a ripoff, but you should see the ripoffs that we're ignoring now. Right? You should see just how bad things have gotten. You should see what our triage looks like. We're leaving a lot of blood on the floor. And this just doesn't even rise to the level where we pay attention to it. And it, it, that is a thing that I think we, we have all felt at various times as the uh, bezel of our current day economy gets worse and worse and the, um, the, the drumbeat of the headlines about different kinds of great beasts getting away with worse and worse crimes becomes uh, 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 faster and louder. And you know, I, I, I think that one of the things about going retrospective and writing a story set in the past lets you do is it lets you remember that we felt this way in 2016. We were like, you remember like, what, fuck you 2016, I can't wait for 2017 to come along. That's gonna be the good year, right? And that this has been a, that every year we seem to wake up this way. And, and you know, the, one of the things about the, the first book in the series that's chronologically the last book in the series is that it embodies a bit of Stein's law that anything that can't go on forever eventually stops, and there's some reckoning there. And, and I'm, I'm sort of getting the shape of what this whole series is gonna be. There's, there's three in the can, and there's a couple more on the drawing board. But I think that's what it's gonna be about, is this build up to this moment where finally Stein's law takes hold, and the thing that can't go on forever eventually stops. The third one of these I'm really excited about, it comes out next February, it's called Picks and Shovels. And it's set in the heroic era of the PC in the 1980s. It's Marty Hench's first adventure. And he goes out to the Bay Area and finds himself working for, um, if you remember, there were these really weird PC companies in the early 80s. He's working for a company called The Three Wise Men that's run by a Mormon bishop, a Catholic priest, and an Orthodox rabbi. But <laughs> it's an affinity scam. And they're doing pyramid selling into faith groups. And they're locking down the PCs and making you buy expensive peripherals. And he realizes he's working for the baddies. So that's his first adventure, his origin story. I had a lot of fun with these. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely felt like as I was reading through more and I, I feel like I've never had the, quite the experience of reading reading a fiction book and getting so mad at the villain that it was distracting me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to finish reading this book. I want to go find this villain. Like, <laughs> um, I did the part... The, and and so throughout reading this, I was like, "Is this is this real?" The the one thing I wanted to ask, when you had them, they they had access to books on the the iPads, but it was only through an app called the Library Store, uh -huh. where it was a library, but you have to pay. I made that up. Yeah. But I but but the, if any of you work in libraries, thank you for your service. Please, library people, stop calling your patrons customers. Call them patrons. It's much more oh. dignified to be a patron than a customer. I don't want to be my doctor's customer. I want to be his patient. I don't want to be my lawyer's customer. I want to be his client. I don't want to be my teacher's customer. I want to be their pupil. And I do not want to be the library's customer. I want to be their patron. No, no, I'm just wondering. Now I'm just stuck on the linguistics of this. Like, there's... A is it like all the good things, we have a specific word for when you go to them, what kind of person you are? You know what it is, is that we used to have lots of different ways of expressing mm -hmm. value, right? We would, mm -hmm. we, we would, you know, if you think about the law, we can talk about um, uh, crimes against property and crimes against people. And so we have murder, which is not theft, right? It's, we don't, it's not theft of your life when you're murdered. And we've arrived at this place where because we reify property relations above all else, we can only describe valuable things using property talk. And so I may even be quoting Jonathan here. Uh, you know, with, with, with um, copyright, you know, there's this whole like, is it theft, isn't it theft? And there's this sense that if you call bad things that happen to your creative labor something other than theft, you're cheapening the offense, right? There's another way of thinking about it, which is that 
Um, there are certain things that happen to our labor, to our dignity, to our posterity, and so on, that are worse because they're not property crimes, right? In the same way that crimes committed against people are worse not because uh, that we, we can't accommodate them, but specifically because we can't accommodate them as property crimes. It would cheapen them if we called murder theft of life, right? It's, it's having a sui generis regime to talk about the value of life that tells you how valuable life is. And we used to have a fairly well-developed set of values for different parts of how we interact with society. A lot of it tied up in professional codes and a sense of vocation and uh, self-regulation among professions, which was not always perfect, but often uh, imbued a, a profession with a certain gravitas and, and, and meant that there was a degree to which you could trust people if they were professionally certified. And a lot of that has kind of evaporated and turned into a very commercial relation. You know, the latest one that's happened is the AMA formally requires doctors to own their practices, but what's actually happened with private equity roll-ups of doctors' practices, um, doctors are now saying, I am nominally on paper the owner of my practice, but I'm not allowed to treat my patients without talking to the management team who come from the private equity company that rolled it up, and they've got ways to, uh, to um, control my conduct if I choose not to do that, where they can sanction me even though technically they're working for me because, in fact, they're really working for the people who own the capital in the firm. Yeah, the the there. I feel like there are so many sort of expressions of this in your book, like of this this phenomenon of of you know systems of humans interacting being taken over by by these various machines and and then made made worse or having have value extracted at the cost of of you know. Uh, lives and work and happiness. Um, when I was, I, I, yeah. you know, I just thought of a parallel that I want to bring up and then I mm -hmm. want to answer oh, your question. Yeah. So there are lots of things about the old good internet that weren't great, but there were some things that were really good. And one of them that worked well, though it didn't always fail well, was the sense among people who are running the old good internet that they were doing it because they cared about the internet per se and its transformative power. And we make a lot of fun of that these days. We call those people starry eyed. But John Postel with a DNS under his desk at USC and you know, the people who uh, ran uh, network backbones, who all knew each other's numbers, the people who, even after like the diaspora from, from Fairchild Semiconductor, who didn't know any of them, no, non, none of them knew exactly how to make a whole microchip, and so they would meet at the secret gathering in the Bay Area once a year to violate their NDAs because it was more important to have microchips like advance than it was to honor their stupid boss's dumb ideas about, about trade secrets. Um, there was this like sense that people were doing it because they cared about the internet and its users. They felt a sense of duty to them. Uh, and you know, that is a thing that carried over into through the, the uh, gradual degradation of the internet where bosses continued to um, appeal to technologists' residual sense of what Fobazi Etar calls vocational awe, where they say, yeah, the reason you need to like sleep under your desk and miss your, miss your mother's funeral and you know, use the clinic we've set up so you can freeze your eggs because you're gonna work through your fertile years is because you are one of the heroes of the digital revolution bringing forth a new world. And you know, th this kind of bit a lot of those bosses in the ass, at least when tech workers had bargaining power, because then they would turn around and they'd say, also, by the way, we're just gonna make this really shitty. And those tech workers you know, who had been motivated with an appeal to their sense of, of duty actually felt a sense of duty and they were like, nope. Not going to do that, and yeah, you can't make me. The guy across the street will give me a better job if you fire me, and uh, frankly, I'd welcome it. And they just couldn't do it for a long time. And you know, one of the, I think, un, uh, uh, underappreciated elements of the increasing precarity of tech workers, 260,000 layoffs last year, is that tech workers just don't have the power to do that in a way that they did in years previous. Yeah, I think something that, that um, it, there's like this uh, thing that people who, who are really interested in like looking at how systems work in general, like sort of architect people with that sort of architect mindset um, can fall into is like thinking, thinking uh, if you think too much about like the rule sets that are set up and like how they interact with each other to you know carry everyone toward an inevitable goal, sort of in 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 a number of different ways you can ignore you can start to like ignore the role that like the people in the system play and the the degree to which the things that they care about drive those sure. decisions and like i like i so i like to try to try to emphasize in my you know comics and things how much like things that work 
so many of them don't just work because the universe like tends toward a system that produces that result. It's because the people in the system want it to work or want to do something, you know, to do that. And that like everything will collapse if people aren't trying to keep it going, you know? And that, that, that it's both like, I don't know, it, it's both good and bad in terms of, you know, building these, you know, architecting these systems, but like, because we can try to build them to work in a good way or work in a bad way, but then like ultimately they're just gonna work the way that the people in them want them to work. Um, and sometimes, and so like, it actually does matter what people think and what they want. And that's something that I think is easy to lose both in like computer science and, and in law to lose track of. It's a thing that I say whenever people in publishing say, oh no, no, books are just another copyrighted work. We license them the same way we license video games or anything else. And so libraries shouldn't be expected to be able to buy books. And you're getting this license that comes with it that says, you know, by being dumb enough to buy this book, you agree we're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and wear your underwear, and make long distance calls. It's just like any other copyrighted work you might buy. <laughs> and I'm like, you do know that books are like older than copyright and also older than printing and also older than binding and also older than commerce. And that like, we have this kind of sentimental attachment to books, right? We buy them even if we don't plan on reading them just to like have them near us, <laughs> right? And we like go over to our friends' houses and we scope out their piles of books and like our loved ones tell us you can't have that many books in the bathroom. And, <laughs> and you know, like there is this risk, right? That you might actually convince people that a book is just a standard data unit, right? No different from like a database license or, you know, some other like random piece of data that you license and then throw away and kind of is ephemeral on your hard drive. You might actually convince them to abide by the dumb terms in your license in your license agreement. At which point, you will have jettisoned the single most valuable asset publishing has, which is that it sells a thing that people are enormously sentimental and even mystical about. And you might actually get people to just treat it like it was an ice cream cone. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm <clears throat> now I'm just thinking about books. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think that I think that looking in sort of such a, a, a far-reaching and clear-eyed way at both the machine and the humans in it is like at the core of what's so appealing about about what you've been writing ever since you've linked to my blog Aww. all those years ago, and 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 that's really cool, and I. Uh, I don't know. I really, I really liked your book. Thank um, you, Randall. That means a lot to me. I think that we're we should yeah. probably move to to Question. asking some questions before and, we run out of time here. And and I'll remind you, a yeah. question has one part and not two. Uh, and it's not more of a comment than a question. It's just a question. Yeah. What did I write down? <laughs> uh, I wrote down. Well, there's your problem, Emily Bender. And then uh, earlier when we were talking about the mode of the book, uh, Heinlein explainer, because um, uh, uh, Paul DeFilippo just published a great review of this book in Locus, where he talked about um, the mode of a Heinlein novel, which, you know, not all of them are great novels, uh, but, but the mode of a Heinlein novel when it works is it puts its arm around your shoulder and says like, look kid, I'm gonna tell you how the world works. And he did me the great compliment of saying that this is this is the affect of, of Marty Hamm, not in an obnoxious way, but in a like, oh yeah, great. Now I'm finally figuring out how the world works. Um, and it was something that I think Jonathan said that made me think of it. And then I, I made a note, but it 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 went nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Book writing and ship posting. How do they interact? Then? How does ship post posting and book writing interact? I don't do a ton of ship posting. I do a lot of long form posting and a little ship posting. The ship posting is pretty ephemeral, but the long form, but the 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 having the database of everything that I've ever written, that is and thought about, that is like massively useful. That's how I wrote nine books during lockdown. Uh, without that, I I would be lost. Um, you know that, and it's a thing that I started doing uh, between my first and second novel. Uh, and the thing is that your first novel is the book that has everything you ever thought of putting in a novel in it. And then no other novel is like that. Every other novel is things that you hadn't been thinking about putting in a novel all your life. And so I was really lucky when the second novel came along that I'd already started blogging and I had this like kind of corpus that I could access. Uh, yeah. Hi there. 
I've really respected your work as educators and people who work on outreach, not just doing deep dives into technical backgrounds. You always make sure to give an amount of background for people who might not be, you know, crazy Linux enthusiasts or whatever reading your books. And I wondered if you ever like feel like you have to work really hard to strike that balance. If there's a point you're trying to make for both of you that you are really trying to reach for, but you're worried it's not going to come across the general audience. You go first, Randall. Um, I, I think that at a, a very young age, I appreciated that people are not always interested in hearing the thing that I am interested in talking to them about. Um, and, and I know that for a long while, I thought, OK, well, I can solve this. I just need to talk faster. So I can get in. I can get everything in before they get out of earshot. Be <laughs> like, no, wait, I need to tell you this other thing about Star Wars. There's this kind of ship that can do this. Uh, um, let me explain about ion cannons. Um, you know, and so I would go really fast. And then I'm like, OK, wait a minute. And I think that for me, a key realization was um, that like you'll see sometimes people get really bitter about this. They'll be like, people just aren't interested in hearing about this thing that's really bad and really important. And it's like, and and I think I've I've really tried to keep um, what I think it, what I try to think about is that there's a lot of stuff in the world, and everyone I talk to has a bunch of other things going on. And like, so what I try to think of, I, I try not to think about like people are interested in this or aren't interested in this, and you know, how does that reflect on them? Instead, I try to think everyone is busy. And I only get a little bit of their time. And I try to think like, what is the minimum like stuff I need to give them for them to understand the thing that I think is cool? And like try to figure out, is that possible with this amount of, of their time? And like just try to have a real sense of like, what things do I th that I think everyone knows might not be you know, well understood by people? So like try to have an eye toward toward that, like paying attention to, oh, I think this is common knowledge, but these people don't, without thinking, ah, and those people aren't as smart as me. Just realize, like, those people are busy and have their own stuff they're learning about. I need to remember they don't know about this thing that I know about, and I do they really need to know it in order to understand this thing? Um, but try to really have, like, genuine respect for people and not condescend to them, because I think people can tell when you're condescending to them, you know? And so, I, like, I try to... Just remember that that um, people, you know, I'm not smarter than other people. They're just busy, and I can only talk, talk to them a little bit, and I need to try to make that count. I think with nonfiction, you know, be, because it's it's blogging and it's iterative, you can try, you can rehearse different versions of the explanation and try to tease it out. But you can also do the thing that hypertext is great for, right? Which is you can have the thing where you first introduce the concept and you flesh it in a really basic way, and then you can build on it and link back to that, and you can kind of let the reader follow the breadcrumb trail or, or not. With fiction, you know, I, I always I, I started really in this mode with um, YA fiction, with the Little Brother books, where I, I realized that when I was a kid, um, facts were really hard to get hold of, right? Like just knowing a thing was itself a kind of social capital, right? So. You know, I remember in my friend group, there was like this thing, this fact that raced around where if you took the receiver of a Bell payphone and unscrewed the top part and then shorted the two screws in the back of the speaker to the chrome on the cradle, you'd get an open dial tone and you could just make phone calls. And this was a thing if you met a, 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 another kid at a stranger or at a party or, you know, whatever, uh, uh, out with friends, you could tell them this and it was like a thing that they would get excited about. And, and it was social capital. By the time I wrote the Little Brother books, this was no longer a thing that you needed. You didn't need to know facts. You needed to know what words to type into a search engine. So you needed to know what was possible, not how to do it. And so the Little Brother books, and I think I carry this over into the Hench books, are about trying to imbue these scenarios with enough verisimilitude that the reader is kind of clued in that if they went and typed it into a search engine, they'd figure out how to do it, which I think worked on you, Randall. You were saying, oh, yeah. you know, you were reading it, and you were like, oh, this seems real. I'm going to go look it up in the search engine. Um, and, and so... Uh, that's a really fun mode to write in, and it's um, it's very different from the you know the mode of the Heinlein explainer or other kinds of fact intensive work. There's 